so welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, welcome to the first uh, first colloquium after the new year. Uh, today our pleasure we have the pleasure to host uh, Ignacy Savitsky, who who works now uh, since since a couple of years uh, in in at the Institute of Physics of the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. Uh, he did his PhD uh, at the University of Chicago uh, back in 20, 2007, and then he held uh, several positions internationally, uh, first uh, at New York University, uh, then at the University of Heidelberg, brief, uh, also briefly at Cape Town in South Africa, later at the University of Geneva as Marie skłodowska Curie Fellow, and after that he joined uh, SACO, I think, or I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. Or we haven't it's decided either. Yeah, Seiko. Because it's, I think it's a Czech acronym, in fact. Yes. No, Originally. it's the uh, Central European Institute of Cosmological. Ah, ah, okay. So maybe Keiko sounds better. Uh, yes, and today we'll hear about modified gravity in cosmology after GW170817. So, ah. is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Maciek. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having invited me to give this talk. Uh, I was hoping to be in Warsaw personally, but uh, uh, you take your wins where you can get them. <laughs> so uh, hopefully this will not be the last time. Um, but uh, let me uh, take uh, a bit of your time to tell you about um, essentially the story um, of uh, trying to understand um, whether it's possible to use the universe to test, uh, test the theory of gravity um, and where that's gone with um, the uh, now detection of gravitational waves and, and how that's actually interacted with, with, with what we've been doing in cosmology for the last uh, decade and a half, probably, this program is kind of gymnastic. Um, but uh, I understand from Maciek that uh, not everybody here thinks about cosmology every day. So uh, what I'm actually going to do is start off a little bit, giving you my own personal take, um, aimed at sort of uh, motivating what, what, what we're doing. Uh, but the current status of uh, where the tests of the standard model of cosmology are, the standard model Lambda CDM, um, and uh, the the tensions that sort of other have been there and, uh, um, and not go, don't seem to be going away. Um, um, and then the, I will then get to this, this question of, uh, you know, how well do we understand gravity and what can we really do and uh, um, whether it's possible to use this modification of gravity to sort of, to, to, to uh, accelerate the expansion of the universe, which is what we've been observing for the last, uh, you know, a few billion years of the universe's age. Um, and um, sort of, I will sort of discuss about how uh, a particular version of uh, way of thinking about this modification of gravity has allowed us to combine this information with what's been happening uh, with the detection of gravitational waves. So finally, I'll kind of talk a bit about whether we can still sort of uh, think about modification of gravity as being a mechanism for this acceleration or whether really we're sort of limited to doing precision testing of, of general relativity. So let me just start off by uh, sort of saying uh, uh, roughly what Lambda CDM is. So this in cosmology, there's a standard model just like in particle physics. Uh, it's a lot simpler. It involves seven numbers um, and a lot of things we know nothing about, right? So. Um, so there are a bunch of assumptions that go into it, uh, which uh, you know people play with by uh, removing them or trying to change them in some way. And uh, those are, in particular, sort of this idea that uh, you know in, in cosmology we typically tend to say that uh, the universe we're not in a special place in the universe. So roughly on on sort of in all in all. When we look at large enough distances and we look at all directions, it looks the same. So the, this is Copernican principle where you sort of assume that the universe is homogeneous isotropic on average on large enough scales. This breaks down clearly on small scales because we're here and not anywhere else. Um, uh, but what that means, it sort of leads to this huge simplification of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of theories and gives you the ability to calculate things. 
And particularly, it reduces everything that is important uh, about the actual background of the universe to just a single function of time. And this is this Hubble parameter. Now, what happens on top of that is a different issue, right? So the so the things get formed, structures get formed, etc. But this the background is really defined by just by just one function of time. Um, so, uh, and if you want the what happens on top tests what your idea about th what what this function of time uh, is made is is is, is, a, is a result of. Uh, then you need some input because indeed the universe is not homogeneous isotropic uh, exactly. So you need some input uh, for initial conditions, and uh, the assumption is that the initial conditions are driven by something that is, you know. Uh, some mechanism which was produced perturbations which are adiabatic, they're nearly scale invariant, not quite, but nearly, um, and uh, and that they most importantly they are coherent superhorizon. So really, that the universe in parts which are never in causal contact looks it still looks exactly the same. Um, and the typical thing that you put there as the simplest mechanism is single field inflation, uh, and this is what goes into this uh, this cosmological standard model. Then there's a question of neutrinos. They tend, they affect uh, physics. Uh, I will maybe get a little bit to, to something about that. Um, they affect the, the observables by washing out structure at small scales. Uh, but uh, they have a mass, but this mass is so far too, too hard to detect for cosmology. But indeed, the people hope that indeed cosmology will be the first one to detect the, the mass of neutrinos, to measure the mass of neutrinos. And then there are the bits we really know nothing about. And one is cold dark matter. And um, on the scales to which I'm referring, essentially, it's just something that doesn't interact and moves on geodesics. Um, it must have been in causal contact with, uh, with anything else, because it seems to have started with no isocurvature mode. That means the same velocities in the early universe as everything else. So something must have caused that. Um, but uh, aside from that, at large scales, it's really just, just dust moving on geodesic. At small scales, it begins to differ, and there are various ideas for this, uh, which change the way that uh, you know, galaxies, the structure of galaxies or, or, or clusters can look like. Uh, for example, this idea of this axionic uh, dark matter, so something very light rather than something very heavy, which is a typical idea. But on large scales, it doesn't really make some difference. And finally, the thing that I'm actually going to really uh, discuss is this uh, final part, which is the um, cosmological constant. So we, you assume that the acceleration of the late universe, which we see because things tend to be seem to be further away than 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 you, than you would get in a universe where there is no such acceleration. Um, the it's caused by just a property of space time, which is the same. So. This is W parameter, which is called the equation of state. It's the ratio of pressure to energy density, and it's minus one ensures that it's always, uh, this, this density is constant. So assuming all of these, you get this, right? So you get a uh, structure, you get a, um, you get a, um, so let me just turn on a pointer here. Um, let's go to this. Um, so you get a uh, you get a universe which is essentially five percent of which we know, and this is stars and gas, hydrogen gas mainly floating around the universe. A quarter about which is dark, you know, something non-relativistic, something that doesn't really interact with light, um, but must have interacted in the past. And then there's the seventy percent which essentially is causing the acceleration and the vacuum energy or not. It's something really have uh, we're trying to ascertain somehow measure it and understand what it is. So, and this works very well. I mean, there are essentially seven numbers, um, and it, it really works to a, to a very large precision, but it's not true that it works perfectly. So one of the things where, which has uh, become a, um, uh, a, a, an increasingly uh, large problem uh, in, in the field is that, um, there is a disagreement on the value of the Hubble parameter. This is the rate of the expansion of the universe today. Um, remember, I told you it's a function of time, so there's some value today, it's some anchor. Uh, this Hubble parameter uh, depending on how it is, has a different value depending how you how you measure it. And uh, um, so just to make things more precise, there's, what I'm talking about is this, there's this H0. Um, so this is a, uh, it's some number. Um, in units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. I will get to, we can see here that it's you know, about 70. Uh, and essentially convert 
a redshift, which is you know recession velocity in some dimensionless units. So you you observe some frequency for some particular line. It was emitted, you know, in the rest frame at some other frequency. There's a redshift, and you can and it allows you to convert this redshift to a physical distance, or vice versa. You know, half a parameter you can get by converting a physical distance and a redshift. Um, and this quantity uh, disagrees depending on whether you measure it using local local tests, and I will explain in a moment what that is, and uh, and the cosmic microwave background. Okay. Um, and then uh, this so this agreement has always been there, but it's been growing, and, and it continues to grow. This data is already uh, this, this plot's a little bit old already, um, as the as the errors tighten. So there's a sort of big disagreement, and it's not that we're measuring. The point is that we're not that we're measuring the same thing uh, using two different ways. We're really measuring two different things and assuming a model in order to try to compare the two of them. So what are we really measuring? What is this H zero measurement? So. Firstly, there's the H0 measurement from the cosmic microwave background. So as you hopefully know, the cosmic microwave background is a relic radiation from the moment uh, of last uh, of recombination. So when the hydrogen, uh, neutral hydrogen formed at a redshift of about 1,000, um, 1,100, something like that. Um, and uh, the surface is not smooth because there are perturbations at that time. These perturbations survive as variations in temperature. Um, and if you can look at this plot, I mean, look at this map of the sky made by Planck, you see that the, there's a typical size for these perturbations. It's about a degree. And if you take a Fourier transform, you know, just do a power spectrum of this, you see that there is indeed this huge power that exists at some one particular scale. Okay, and the detailed structure of this is the bit that's actually lambda, the, the success of lambda CDM. So the detailed structure of this plot, you can see the data points, they really perfectly match the the uh, this 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 power spectrum, the detailed structure of this is um, uh, very well understood. Um, but you know there are some anchors that you have to fix, and one of them is exactly the physical size of this uh, of this uh, of this initial uh, of this of this uh, main harmonic. And this has been measured to be about one degree, okay, to a very high precision. You can see over here. Uh, now. We know the physics of the early universe, or at least we know the physics of recombination very well. And the, the physical size of this that we see, you know, in the end is just uh, you, there's, some, there's some angular scale and there's, a, there's some particular ruler in the sky that this forms, uh, is really a result of, of a sound wave propagating from the beginning of the universe to recombination. And uh, this physical size of the sound wave is you know, some integral like this. The sound wave have some sound speed, which we, we think we understand very well. There's some, there's some expansion of the universe, expansion history of the universe from recombination to the beginning of the universe. Uh, but you can see that you might be worried about the fact that you don't really know how the universe started, but that's also the bit of this integral that doesn't contribute at all. So this contribute is really, this integral really has a kernel which is purely around the recombination surface. And we think we understand very well that very well because we understand the the shape of the CMB very well. So this is a number, you know, this 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 is this size is fixed. It's 150 megaparsecs today. Um, it's it's very hard to modify it and by changing something without upsetting some part of physics that's very well constrained. Um, okay, and then this is you know that this is projected. It subtends some angle uh, for the observer. So if you know the physical size of this, you know the angle, you can get the distance. And the distance is really, again, same sort of integral, but from the recombination surface to us today, and again, in this, in this age. And in lambda CDM, you know exactly the form of this function. It's exactly given by the fact the universe is dominated by dark matter and the cosmological constant. And therefore, you can measure H0. So this is the CMB measurement. It's really some statement about the integral of the distances up to the CMB, it's about the sound horizon, and the real observable, which is the angle. Now, this is very different to the other measurement, which is this local measurement of, of H0. And uh, there what happens is that you really try to build a distance ladder. Uh, so you really say, look, I'm going to look in our galaxy, a particular type of star, Cepheid, which pulsates with some frequency, which is very which is related to, to luminosity. And then you find the same stars and galaxies sort of at intermediate distances. And though, there you might hope to find the supernova, which uh, is a standardizable candle. And you can really then pinpoint the 
the absolute luminosity of the supernova. And then assuming the supernova don't change, you then extend a little bit further to low redshifts. I mean, redshifts we're talking about, you know, 0.01. So really this is a very local universe. Uh, and you try to find these supernovae. So this is what Adam Reese and co have been doing as part of the, uh, the shoes uh, measurement of H0. And uh, this is what led to this uh, set of results. So you kind of have Planck and early universe measurements, CM CMB related, um, or even BBN, you know, you don't need the CMB for this, um, over here. And then the measurements in the late universe using different distance anchors, uh, and even one which is very different, which is sort of to do with time delays and strong lensing, giving you diff values different by about, you know, 10% with errors of the order of a few percent. So really we're talking about depending which combination of data you use, four or five sigma. And this has been growing, so this is not going away. The extent now that sort of, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. I think everyone on all sides believes it's a problem. Um, and uh, just to understand really what, what, what I mean physically, what is happening is that, uh, so this is this history of H of Z assuming lambda CDM. So Planck constraints are this very thin line that goes through here. Uh, these are various measurements of the distance uh, to intermediate redshifts. So using Bayern acoustic oscillations, um, that's just another standard ruler, ruler actually related to the same sound horizon. So in principle, changing the sound horizon changes this, these, these guys too. Um, and there's the measurement of Rees. So essentially the situation is this. Either you believe the, that the sound horizon is correct, you assume lambda CDM is correct up to some point, and then you have to do something rather crazy right at the end. You have to accelerate faster than the cosmological constant. Or maybe you might try to somehow shift all of these so that they're further up, and H of Z itself shifts them further up. But this is very hard to do without really upsetting this detailed structure of the CMB. Um, and, uh, this is essentially, we, we just don't know right now, really, what, what uh, um, so the, the hope is right now the gravitational waves eventually will resolve this. I'm not sure whether sort of the resolution will come from anything else. Okay, so that's, that's one problem. And let me talk about uh, another set of issues, and this is to do with, um, uh, and this is to do with, uh, you know, what else you can do. So, um, so I have this background, and if that background is lambda CDM, I can, predict very precisely what happens on this background. So I have some over density, this over density producer of gravitational field. I have my Einstein equations uh, for non-relativistic matter over here. Um, this over density will produce a uh, gravitational field which will then uh, attract other over densities. And therefore this way you, just on the assumption of essentially Poisson equations, there's nothing else here, plus matter conservation, you can work out uh, how uh, structure should form. And uh, you know, the, the background that you put in sort of goes into this, but other than that, this is, the structure is completely fixed. Um, and uh, the one thing I should mention, the difference between Newtonian gravity and then general relativity is the fact that there are two potentials in principle. So there's a sort of, there's the gravitational potential really is this one. Uh, as you can see, this one that, that enters the, the equation for the, you know, for the evolution of matter uh, um, uh, the over densities. Uh, but there's another potential, which is, you know, sort of uh, a spatial curvature that, uh, that in principle could be unrelated. Uh, but in general relativity, if all matter is uh, non-relativistic, essentially they're the same. So it's this equal to zero here. But it turns out that when light propagates, it's not sensitive just to this potential psi, but it's, pot it's sensitive to, two pot to the sum of these two potentials, phi and psi. So in principle, there's a, you really have two different sets of physics which can test what the, what the, the, the way that the perturbations are evolving and really what the amount of structure is. So one is lensing of light. Uh, so how strongly the geodesics of light deviate from straight lines. And the other one is how quickly structure collapses and velocities of the structure. So lensing uh, is exactly, um, this is what's called cosmic shear, is exactly such a thing. So you really take some light, which is emitted by objects which have, have some non-zero uh, size and have some shape. 
uh, the bundle of uh, photons which come toward you, and uh, the intervening matter uh, warps this uh, this bundle of geodesics in such a way that the shape of the of the galaxies when they arrive uh, at the observer is slightly different than the one that that that, that was emitted. And, so, and this shear is related exactly to the gradients of these potentials integrated in some particular way. Uh, so if there's an amplitude here for this, for these perturbations, this amplitude is sort of proportional to the amplitude of this lensing, if you want. Um, and uh, so this is something that this is a very hard thing to do. Uh, and Maciek can tell you much more than, than I can about the, the dirty part of this. Um, but the situation is currently that um, Again, there's sort of disagreements between, there, I think there are three major experiments doing this, in, sort of, which have enough size to sort of say something about cosmology. And they kind of, they kind of disagree among each other and they disagree in principle with Planck. So Planck, the, the Planck prediction for this, given what you see for the size of the perturbations in the, in the CMB is, is here. So this is roughly this amplitude of this, uh, of this, uh, of this potential. Um, and then you have, uh, sort of, let's say, the latest results from the, uh, from the KIDS project. Uh, this is a, so this is a lensing survey. It sort of uh, measures a big part of the sky. Um, and you can see that, you know, these two ellipses don't really overlap. So the sort of the, the headline number is that there's a two sigma tension between the Planck results and, uh, and, and KIDS. Uh, with a um, with kids showing that the amplitude is less than you'd expect in lambda CDM, given where you started with at the Planck normal, you know, at the Planck normalization. There's another one which is DES, uh, and this is sort of about to report its new set of data, but they haven't yet. But if you read the if you read the papers, they seem to be kind of maybe walking away from the statement before that uh, they had a uh, uh, they had a um, that they were consistent with Planck at the time. Um, so really there's this sort of two sigma tension here. So as if lensing doesn't have enough power. And there's another set of physics, which is to do with measuring the velocity of galaxies. Uh, so you can uh, uh, essentially look at uh, clustering galaxies. So the power spectrum of uh, or the two point correlation function of the, of, of the distribution of galaxies. Um, so, you essentially take galaxy pairs and you and you plot you know some, with some separation physical separation and you can plot it at two point correlation functions a function of distance and because if the universe since the universe is homogeneous isotropic you in real space this thing is spherical but because you're projecting onto a line of sight because you're only seeing one of the directions is projected just to be purely a redshift and not really a distance uh, so you have an angle, and you have a and you have a and you have a redshift in the orthogonal direction. What actually happens is that the this two point correlation function is 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 a is ellipsoidal. It's squashed. By measuring this degree of squashing, you can essentially measure the you can measure the um, uh, you can measure the velocity of, of these galaxies. Okay, and this is called retrospace space distortions. And uh, so this is, you know, this is a compilation of all the data together. Let's say the Planck best fit line again, we see here. And uh, I mean, they're essentially consistent, so I'm not going to claim they're not, but uh, there is a sort of funny thing, which is that most of the points tend to lie below the line. Um, so, um, you know, you will see there's a, there's a, the center of the fit is, seems to be that it's a bit less power than it. So maybe there's something there. And like I said, these two things, lensing and the, and the uh, retrospace space distortions are made of different potential combinations and therefore in principle could be different. And it would be a sign that something is off with gravity um, compared to what you'd expect in general relativity. Uh, let me skip that because I'm thinking I'm a little behind. So, okay, so how would, so I'm gonna talk about, modif so, now, so this is where the, I think the data lie that, that, that I'm concerned with. Um, now let me try to, tell you a bit about sort of how to think about modified gravity and really what are we trying to do. Uh, so I've taken essentially something that doesn't work, but just but it's simple enough so that I can sort of present to you a, uh, um, you know, an archetypal modification of gravity. So you sort of understand how we, are, how we were hoping to make this work. Um, so imagine the following situation. Um, uh, normally the, action for, for, for gravity uh, is the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is just uh, the Ricci scalar 
and this uh, g to the minus one is just Newton's constant. Uh, so it's normalized in this way. There's some factor of two that I've thrown away, but uh, let's not worry about it. Uh, imagine that I augment it with some correction, which will be important at, uh, at low convergence. So imagine, you know, that's a kind of question. So uh, this is a modification of gravity. Okay, great. Uh, so I can go ahead and calculate things, but, but how is this supposed to work? Well, one thing that you very quickly realize is that this is if not really modified gravity and you still just have uh, the metric as the only propagating degree of freedom, but actually you've added an extra scalar. So there is a, uh, there is a thing where the moment you deviate away from general relativity, you actually add an extra degrees of freedom. Uh, and this theory is of sort of Brands Dickey type, uh, if you've ever thought about this. Uh, you can do a Legendre transform, essentially restore the scalar. So now you have explicitly a scalar degree of freedom, which modifies this G, Newton's, Newton's constant, and some additional you know, potential uh, and so on. So now the idea is that if I can make the scalar move during the evolution of the universe, then the effective G that the, that the curvature sees, the effective strength of gravity will change. So if I can make gravity stronger and G larger, then I would in fact get H to increase relatively to what it would be. And therefore it would, you know, if I make it increase large by enough, I would, I would make the universe accelerate. So this is roughly the idea. I somehow change essentially what is my Friedman equation, which describes the evolution of the, which describes the universe of, of the universe, uh, of the background cosmology, um, to, to account for the, for the difference in the, in the, in the cosmological history compared to a pure dark matter universe, which would be my sort of, uh, what I expected before 1997. Um, now, the bonus of this, and actually the reason why you actually know anything, it's possible to say anything, is that this is not just a modification of the Friedman equation, but in fact, you know, the, the whole system must be covariant and it uh, should be defined without, you know, background and perturbations being separate. So actually what happens is that in these theories, you violate the weak equivalence principle, and it's no longer true that matter and light see the same strength of gravity. So that was hinting at before that if you use vector space distortions and, and lensing, you, ten, you, you test slightly different uh, uh, combinations of the gravitational potentials. Um, so indeed, you can you can go ahead and sort of look at what what structure formation would look like under these case, under under these uh, these circumstances. Um, but there's a price to pay, which is that we, we don't see this locally. This is not in the solar system. This has been sort of excluded. Such simple models cannot exist in the solar system. So somehow you have to hide it. And this is this discussion of screening and uh, sort of nonlinearities in the system, which kind of make it go away at small scales. Um, OK. Uh, so well, great, okay. small scales, large scales, you know, I mean, really, what do we know about gravity? What have we tested? So here's a sort of nice plot that I always use uh, because it's very sort of clear, uh, telling you about you know really the systems we've been measuring uh, to measure to, to 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 constrain gravity and where cosmology is compared to that. So on the two the two axes are curvature on the vertical, which kind of goes as one over r squared away from a spherical body, uh, some point source for gravity, point mass and the potential uh, going as one over r away from this uh, away from this uh, this mass so something like a point mass like the sun gives you a line on this uh, on this plot where all the orbits of all the planets lie etc um, so you can see that roughly there are three patches here it's a bunch of uh, planets in the solar system whose orbits we've been tracking for centuries and we sort of know pretty well and those match general relativity very well there's the uh, binary pulsar, um, uh, and uh, which uh, again we understand the decay of that orbit very well and matches general, general relativity to some precision. Uh, so that must be uh, that must be uh, well uh, that's well constrained. And now there are these LIGO measurements here uh, of black holes, so very high so high curvatures, so very high potentials. You know, essentially close to Schwarzschild radius here. Uh, and much higher curvatures than anywhere over in the solar system. But cosmology is here. Really, okay, BBN, very early universe, big, uh, big bang nuclear synthesis is over here, but we don't really know very much about that. But last scattering surface is this line. 
And uh, the Lake Universe today is this line. So really everything we really have access to sort of happens to be here, which is a completely different set of scales than experienced by you know, curvatures and potentials than experienced by, um, by any of the systems which we've been using to constrain gravity. So in principle, maybe indeed it's possible that uh, you know, gravity just behaves differently on these scales then something happens that's very high in nonlinear and it, you know, and, and it gets hidden over here. Um, so uh, uh, that's, the, that's the general idea that we really don't know here. We're really testing things we've never tested before. And therefore uh, it's worth trying to understand whether, whether general relativity really works. Um, let me just sort of flag here. There's a scale of a thousand kilometers. I'm gonna call lambda three and this will, this will come up later um, but just just uh, I'll, I'll remind you again but just just i'll flag it here it's a kind of scale which is natural to write down in this theory which is something to do with Planck and something to do with the hubble parameter um so okay so let me let me be very simple and say look uh, gravity is modified let me just introduce let me break my equations so look this is my newtonian version of gravity i don't care about uh, the real nice uh, uh covariant structure all i want to do is break my equations and test some parameters so I can do it like this. I can introduce two numbers, mu and eta. Actually, they're really functions of time. But, uh, uh, but you know, introduce two, two such things, and then I can try to constrain them. Okay? And this is what people have been doing. So Planck, there you go. This is a Planck constraint on this, uh, on this, on this thing. Uh, so let me just go back here. So eta tests to what extent phi and psi are the same, and mu tests about how strong gravity is from the point of view of, uh, of the, of the uh, of the accelerating uh, massive massive particles. So. Ignacio, can I have kind of a quick question? Yes. Uh -huh. on. Yeah, in principle, these are functions not only of time but also of, of space, like usually k vector. If you want to have any kind of screening, or if you want to say that in solar system they go to unity, uh, is that not right? Yeah, no, that's 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 exactly right, and this is why there's another way to do it. So now I'm gonna get to that. Okay, thanks. Hopefully. <laughs> Um, so, but, but, but the simplest thing is really break my equations in the simplest way possible. Actually, I don't, uh, it's hard to understand how to even do this on a, when you get to sort of super horizon scales in this way. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, there are codes, there are codes where this has impl been implemented in some way. And what you get out of them is something like this, that essentially, uh, the cosmological data as it was in 2018 constrains these parameters to order one. And okay, they're functions of time, so it's a number. This mu zero and eta zero are, are numbers. They multiply uh, omega de, so that's the density of dark energy. They parameterize in this, in this way as a function of time. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, so sort of they constrain them to order one. Um, okay, if you want to look at more detail and you're being really sort of uh, hopeful, you will see that, okay, the lensing, this is the lensing guy. Unfortunately, they don't plot it. That would have been a much better plot, honestly. So lensing, you can see, is, uh, is roughly consistent with, uh, with uh, so Planck's consistent with general relativity. Um, uh, although remember that uh, um, other, measure, um, other measures of lensing are not. Um, so this gives you y equals to zero. And there's a kind of 10% deviation away from uh, for the growth. So that's a bit slower. But again, this is you know look at the errors. It's 0.3 to my to plus 0.2. So really, you know, it's meaningless, uh, even though it's in the direction of being slightly less power. Okay, so this is really where we are right now. And of course, the next generation is supposed to fix this up. So the next generation of probes is designed really to to measure these things properly. Okay, but what does what does like measuring these things properly mean? What are we really trying to measure here? So let me get to sort of theoretical thing here a little bit. So first thing is. Um, uh, the important thing to, to bear in mind is that uh, it's been known since the 70s that general relativity is actually the only possible theory for the metric. If, if you assume a small number of things, uh, that there's a covariant action, you have four dimensions, things are local, and it's the only degree of freedom in gravity. Okay, so if you want to do anything else, you have to break something here. And uh, I'm gonna, in my talk, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm, 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 I'm constantly thinking about breaking the last one um, so there's really an extra part of gravity, which is somehow, you know, it could be various things. It could be another tensor, it could be a vector, it could be a scalar, something like that. But it's really like a, 
it's a gravity-like object where you really care about the classical value. It's really it's not uh, it's not a quantum field in the sense of uh, in the sense of being just uh, some scalar which produces particles which you can then uh, you know so treat as a fluid or something like that. Um, so this is what happy people have been doing for 15 years, and of course, if you give people enough time and enough money, they will just uh, explore all sorts of things. So you end up with this uh, bestiary where you break various assumptions of Lovelock's theorem and you end up with models which are better or worse motivated. You know, mostly people are motivated by finding new, new ideas for testing things. Um, but you end up with, you know, with, with tens of uh, different ideas uh, at some point. And okay, if you really want to test it, then you, what, you have to build a code for each one of them. You have to, you have to work out what the uh, dynamics are build it into a code, constrain some parameters, and every time there's a new data set, you have to redo everything from scratch. This was really like, a, at some point, this became just a non-impossible uh, to, to do this. Um, so, um, I want to sort of say that the, the, the thing that really kind of collapsed this huge space onto something that was, that was really actually uh, smarter, was sort of being inspired by by the ideas uh, of uh, that were being used in, in the theory of inflation, um, and that's if you ever thought about general relativity and how to solve it numerically, you will have met this ADM uh, this ADM construction. If you haven't, then maybe you've not seen this. But the idea here is really that you are you essentially right now, general relativity doesn't have a time really. This it's covariant. There's no this is invariance. You are not uh, you don't have a good coordinate. For time, but you can introduce one. So you can do a split of the metric into a particular choice of coordinates, you know, time, space, just pick slices, and you end up decomposing this four dimensional metric into something called the lapse, the shift ni, and the, um, and the spatial metric hij. Okay, so that's, those are really your variables of the metric decomposed onto this thing. And cosmology is a great place to do this because there is a very natural time definition, which is this co-moving time. Um, so you can simplify things a lot if you go into this called the unitary gate. So really, you basically assume that your slices, this is including perturbations, are such that the scalar field defines your time coordinate. Okay, and provided the perturbations are not very large, this is a this is always possible to do. Uh, so uh, this gives you a very uh, much simplified view of, of really what the what the dynamic what the dynamic of dynamic of variables are. Um, and you are you you are your your only possible variables which you can write down uh, and study, assuming that. There is this FRW background that's perturbed slightly and therefore has some particular remaining symmetries and so on. It's just these, these variables, the lapse, the shift, and the, and the spatial metric. And the spatial metric can be embedded in this uh, external space-time in some particular way. So you get curvature of the spatial metric itself, and you get this extrinsic curvature. Okay, the details of this are not so important. I just want to say that there's a kind of limited set of variables which you can use to formulate actions for perturbations, um, and uh, you sort of cannot do anything else. It's not that you can produce any possible, you know, any possible theory. If you want things to be covariant deep down and also propagate only a, a set number of degrees of freedom, you are limited to some, to some you're actually quite limited. So what, what really this means is that you, when you write down the all possible actions for some theory of gravity on a cosmological background, you actually end up with only five terms. Um, so if you have more degrees of freedom, there could be more. But if you have a single degree of freedom that dominates, these are, these are the, this is it. And uh, there are some additional constraints which are polynomial in these coefficients of these terms, which mean that, you know, give you stability. And a simple one to understand is, for example, that the Planck mass should be positive because if it's not, then gravity becomes repulsive and things are unstable. Um, but in the end, this is it. You kind of you cannot write anything more. Um, and uh, the uh, the really nice thing about this is that so have you kind of actually find you encode uh, different sets of physics in each of these operators. Okay, so these are uh, that's firstly and secondly that this is really defined with respect to some background that you've picked. So you pick separately completely some background H of Z, 
And on top of that, you say, I'm going to test gravity by writing down these parameters, the all functions of time, these alphas. And I'm going to try to constrain them. And any theory you might come up with will look like this when you try to work out the perturbations. There's nothing more, essentially. And, the, and essentially, general relativity is all these guys equal to 0. And any theory you come up with, in the end, maps onto some particular subset. So this allows you to, to sort of think universally about writing down codes or something like this and doing tests, which are not really tests of a single model that, uh, that someone came up with. So that's one aspect. Another aspect, if you look, I color coded blue and green. The blue is the things that do only the scalar. So something to do with structure formation, uh, uh, you know, scalar perturbations, collapsing and, and forming. The green affects both things, affects this structure formation in the standard way. In addition to that, it also affects gravitational waves, and this will be key here. Okay, so, uh, so let me just say that, okay, you know, reason I'm, so, you know, we uh, uh, were one of the groups who were doing this uh, some years back and, and with the aim exactly of creating some universal code, which sort of does modify gravity in cosmology in a way that's sort of uh, very universal. And indeed, uh, so we have produced such a code that's been out for a few years, it's public. Um, and you can predict things like, uh, you know, the, the CMD uh, power spectrum from it or the dark matter power spectrum. You can see that if you modify gravity, you turn on some particular, you know, version of modification. You see that, for example, you get slightly more power at small scales and slightly less power at large scales. So this is this idea that, you know, this mu is larger than one, gravity is stronger than this in GR, but only at large scales, but, sorry, only at small scales, but at large scales, in fact, it, uh, it, uh, it is not. So this quasi-static idea that, that, that uh, Wojtek was referring to, that, that this is just a constant across all scales, is just clearly not true if you do it properly. Um, and, and roughly, the, the take, you know, again, today we can't really constrain them very well uh, in cosmology. And the, the big hope is that the next generation of, 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 of surveys will give you enough data to constrain these parameters to 1%. So this is really the precision that, that cosmology will eventually have. So but what, what, what was interesting about this particular way of formulating it, which was really not obvious without doing it in this way, is that there's this really very tight relation between gravitational waves and, and the scalar perturbations. Okay? So there are parameters of these theories which I would normally try to measure for example, this eta not equal to one. So I'm trying to do some experiment comparing lensing to, to growth rates uh, to measure this eta not equal to one to come up with some uh, sense of whether these, these particular theories, these operators are up here. But they also affect the propagation of gravitational waves in the following way, that here's my equation for the evolution of gravitational waves in on a cosmological background and has these two corrections. One's alpha t, the correction to the speed, and one's alpha m, which is a sort of uh, correction to the friction term. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship between these things not being non-zero and eta not being one. So if you're a cosmologist, you say, well, maybe in cosmology you measure them, and therefore the guys doing gravitational waves will, uh, will know something about propagation of gravitational waves. But in reality, it worked the other way around, right? So uh, we detected gravitational waves. In particular, we detected gravitational waves from, with an optical counterpart which allowed us to measure the speed of gravitational waves and, and uh, really constrain any, any theories which have such operators. Um, so this will happen in, uh, well, the paper came out in 2018, but in 2017, uh, a burst, uh, gamma ray burst was detected uh, uh, from uh, being sourced by uh, a neutron star merger, a neutron star, neutron star merger together with gravitational waves, a separation of about two seconds. And given it was a cosmological distance, it's about 40 megaparsecs, this gives you this, this you know, we're talking about 1% constraints in the future in cosmology for this particular operator. And here we're talking 10 to minus 50. Okay, so uh, it is really sort of constrained a huge part of the parameter space. And you think that was it, but then so people realize, in fact, there's even more. Uh, which is another quick comment if, uh -huh. if you're not uh, angry mm -hmm. so but this this really constrain only conformal uh, sorry this formal part of modification conformal are basically predicting the same uh, yeah yeah i will i will I will, yeah, I will I will i will i will get there mm -hmm. so then there is the uh, but another part that's constrained uh, which was you know only 
pointed out, uh, well, 2019 now, um, the, was that, in fact, the moment that you have this, uh, so there was a parameter called alpha h, it's called beyond Hondesky, it doesn't really matter uh, exactly what, 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 what the theory is, but uh, there is one of, the, one of these uh, effective operators that, that I wrote down uh, what is alpha h, and so for the class of the theory, is it, it, it's non-zero. And whenever it's non-zero, it turns out that the gravitational waves can decay to the scalar field. Um, and uh, you're in a, it's, it's a one to two decay, but it's a, we're non in a non-Lorentz invariant situation, so that's okay because the cosmological background is a medium. And uh, there is a coincidence, which is that this lambda three scale I mentioned, which is the scale that enters in many of these operators, uh, it's some combination of M Planck and H zero, is actually the same as the LIGO frequency. And it just happens that even though there's this, you know, in principle you think, ah, look, this operator is hugely suppressed uh, by some scale. Uh, okay, it's very sensitive to frequency, but okay, it's suppressed, it's nothing. Turns out that this is roughly, you know, order one, and therefore this alpha H is constrained to one power 10 to the 20. Um, and again, you know, it's a huge sector of the, of the theoretical space, which was just, just killed by this, even though there is a caveat. And this is sort of to say that, um, the uh, lambda three is actually cut off of this theory, and it's not certain whether the gravitational waves really you can calculate in this simple way. So um, I I can come back to this if anyone wants to to ask. But in principle, people are saying that it's possible that uh, so we don't know what the UV completion is. But if you knew the UV completion, it might be the case that at scales close to lambda three you would actually really not see this background and you would really see sort of essentially Minkowski space for the gravitational waves and they would really be propagating at the speed of light and you wouldn't uh, actually, you know, these, these, these tests in fact would be irrelevant uh, for, cosmological, uh, compared, for cosmological theories. Uh, but to say that, uh, I just came, I want to come back to this plot and to say that, okay, LIGO in principle measured something in emission, measured something that was very, very uh, high curvature and very high potential but the propagation of gravitational waves, in fact, tests exactly the same medium that we're trying to test by, by doing structure formation cosmology. And, and it has tested it much better than doing cosmology, right? So it's kind of, uh, uh, well, maybe if you want to test gravity, use gravity. Uh, so, so to come back uh, to Wojtek's question, there was the bit which is the conformal part, just like this alpha m. Um, so this bit, in fact, is not constrained. Um, and uh, the the statement is the following that so so essentially if this thing were to constrain to be zero then there's no chance of ever observing this gravitational slip this eta not equal to one uh, so you'd be exactly on this line just just by definition and there's no point in even exploring it right so uh so the question is can we measure this and so far we haven't okay what this thing really is is the evolution of the strength of gravity the evolution of g newton as a function of time we know it's constrained to about 10%. So we know that if you compare the value of G Newton on Earth, and you look at the early universe, uh, Big Bang nuclear synthesis, uh, the universe had to be roughly the same as it is now, or you would get too much or too little deuterium. And this is what actually constrains G to be, to be about uh, no different than 10% over this whole history. But, uh, okay, firstly, it's on Earth, not in cosmology, there are two different things, uh, but uh, anyway, 10% is a large. So it turns out that you can try to measure this by building a Hubble diagram for gravitational waves. So if you end up with enough uh, um, uh, gravitational wave uh, emission events measured together with some optical counterparts, you can look at not only the distance to them, which is what you get from the gravitational wave, but also the redshift. You can build out a Hubble diagram just as you have done for supernovae. And you will, uh, you will measure, uh, again, this is the functional redshift. And this doesn't have to be exactly the same as it is in GR, as, in, as it is for light, sorry, as it is for light. Uh, so in fact, whenever the Planck mass runs, in fact, these distances are different. So, uh, you know, you can roughly estimate how well you could possibly do uh, with something realistic. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, next 20 years, maybe you can get it down to a few percent. So this, uh, the error on this guy, assuming it's constant, of, you know, which is another big assumption. Uh, but uh, in principle, it's not impossible to do, even with the fact that it would be very hard to get optical counterparts for black hole merger events at large, at large redshifts with, with these. So, um, so this is another 
if this were to happen, then really you collapse all these gravitational theories really onto being a modification of uh, really onto a single dimension here, which really helps uh, in constraining things from cosmology. Um, let's see, 48 minutes. Um, so where we left with, uh, so let me get back to this. So now if you believe that it's, the theory of gravity is essentially something like GR plus a scalar, and you want to make it as general as possible given the constraints we've talked about, from this huge space of theories, you're kind of left with essentially what looks like this. And uh, um, the, uh, so this is an action for a scalar, you know, this is an action for gravity and a scalar field, but X is this uh, kinetic term of a canonical kinetic term for a scalar. Um, and roughly, actually, this splits into two classes of theories, one of which has this phi dependence here, and therefore has eta not equal to one, uh, but otherwise the canonical scalar field, which doesn't move very much. So this class of theories has eta not equal to one, but cannot accelerate the universe. And this is because you need to screen in a very particular way um, and, uh, well, I can discuss this if, if anyone wants to find out more. Um, but, uh, and then there's the other class, which is something that looks like this, that uh, we introduced uh, 10 years ago now, and we call it kinetic gravity braiding. And you can think of it as a theory of gravity, but you can also think of it as some kind of imperfect fluid uh, with a diffusion of charge. Okay, we can read this as a kind of uh, strange statement uh, because of the time. Um, but uh, if, you, if you look at, uh, so these theories, they never have anisotropic stress. Gravity is always stronger than this in GR, but what you can do is you can have W less than minus one. And if you remember, this is sort of what you wanted for this H zero in principle. To fix up H zero, you have to accelerate more than a general relativity. And typically this is uh, sick. So for normal things, this is just terrible. Breaking this null energy condition gives you some sort of instability. Here it doesn't seem to, in fact, it's sort of, uh, um, it's still not quite understood quite, quite how, how it does it and whether it's true at nonlinear level, but at linear level, at least it's true. So there are no ghosts in the kinetic gravity gradient? Exactly, there, there are no ghosts despite W being less than minus one. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so this is, no, this is the, so, so this is a whole family of things. I mean, you have two functions you can pick from, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, when we introduced this, we wanted just a single parameter. So we introduced a, uh, something looked like this. So uh, just a single parameter, the kinetic term for a scalar, but with the wrong sign. So Minkowski space is not allowed here because otherwise this thing would really be, um, would be the, would be, um, would, 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 would essentially be a ghost, but, this, but it's improved by this, by this higher derivative operator. Um, and such theories, uh, exactly, can give you this W less than minus one. So actually, in principle, you can so you know you can you can uh, you can try to constrain this and see if it's possible to for this to actually explain the totality of data, and actually it works pretty well on some level. I uh, see I've managed to fit H zero, okay, at the price of having to have some measurement of the mass of neutrinos. Um, so this is, by the way, this possible problem with uh, modification of gravity in that frequently they ha they do to the power spectrum similar things as neutrinos do. As neutrino masses do. So there's a degeneracy between the two. So indeed, I, I improve here. I have to have some neutrinos to compensate for the fact my power spectrum doesn't quite look right. Uh, and this works great, except for one thing. This thing uh, gives you uh, an ISW effect. So this is uh, a contribution at the low, at the large scales in the, in the temperature, temperature power spectrum of the CMB, uh, which is of the right size but the wrong sign. So the potential here, because gravity is more attractive, is growing rather than decaying. And this is completely killed by doing a cross-correlation uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with galaxies. Um, so in the end, this doesn't work on the simple level. I mean, so there are improvements you can do to this by introducing more parameter always, but uh, um, you know, the simplest thing doesn't quite work. But, this would have been a, a great way of actually really solving this H0 issue if, 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 if it had. Um, so I'm basically out of time. So let me just uh, uh, leave this here and say the following, that uh, as far as I'm concerned, tensions in, in, in the measurements in cosmology are not really going away. And sort of they're, they're there. And so sort of people tend to, 
because they've been there for a long time. People just tend to shrug sometimes and say, look, uh, yeah, whatever. It's probably some systematic stuff figured out eventually. But I really think that this is something that uh, that's, it's, it's worth thinking about still. Um, uh, but this great idea that uh, people had to sort of use gravity to do acceleration, I think is kind of, and use cosmology to test gravity in a very precise way, is still kind of not happened. So we have order one tests, but the sort of percent level uh, is promised for the future, but uh, testing gravity directly somehow tests gravity better. So I've said already, somehow that this, that it's shockingly, it's shocking how strong the constraints have been from the, from the, from the gravitational wave detections. Um, and yeah, and sort of, to sort of like a kind of uh, mixed message, which is that if you really believe that uh, a zero is not an issue, with W is around minus one, um, then I think there is sort of very little possibility for modified gravity to give you acceleration. It doesn't work like that. So I think you really need to make W deviate from minus one. This a zero tension is a great, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, motivator to do that. Uh, and indeed, if you want to solve this issue in this way, you have to have something like modification of gravity because this W needs to be less than minus one. Um, and the nice thing about that is it really gives you huge uh, testable corrections to, to structure formation. So not order 1%, but actually, you know, order 10 plus percent. So, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll get there. And I'm even in time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice talk uh, and for keeping in time. Uh, we have... We have still some time for questions. Uh, I see that Wojtek raised his hand and Suhani also. So maybe let's start with, with Suhani. Hello. Um, yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask that uh, most of the models of the modified gravity, they are proposed to enhance gravity or mm -hmm. in general. So uh, you mean you make it stronger? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do they? Uh, how will they explain for the sigma tension and the uh, f sigma the lower values that you observed? In yeah. So okay. So actually, it's not even that they proposed in order to make it stronger. It's really a um, there's. It's very. It's very hard making it weaker. So it's a sort of. Uh, so so there was this alpha h operator discussed that can actually reduce the strength of gravity, but with like this constraint that exists currently from the gravitational waves, it's very hard to make it weaker. So really, it just is always stronger. But what you can do is that you can uh, change the background expansion history. So exactly, if you make W less than minus one, you, you, well, under normal circumstances, if you already had GR with W less than minus one, you would, uh, your potential would be decaying even more quickly and therefore you would grow less. So what you can do is you can, by ch if you were to change W enough to make the potentials decay sufficiently, you can then add some of the extra uh, additional, uh, you know, the, the additional scalar force that appears, additional fifth force that appears in these in these theories, um, and you can uh, you can let's say get back to where you were, or you know a bit a bit less. So this is how you end up. Uh, this is how you end up decreasing the uh, um, decreasing the, the the growth rate in the, the integrated growth rate from the from the CMB to today. Okay, so it would be an interplay uh, between the W parameter and the G effective parameter. Yeah, exactly. So it's really, it's really that. And so, the, so the, the disadvantage of this effective method of doing things is that the, you really separate the background from the perturbations. So lovely thing about it is that you can just put whatever background you want, and you know what the constraints are. You put whatever pertur you know, the perturbations you can test separately. But uh, the disadvantage is that actually, really, they both be probably driven by similar parameters in a real realistic model, right? So then, if you were to com so if you combine the two, this is this this is this this is why I left this slide here. Really, if you put in a model and you solve it fully, background and perturbations on top, then you find out that you have you have really um, uh, yeah you can it really looks very different than just sort of you know t changing your gravity by one or two percent by increasing your strength something like that. On a, on a standard LCDM background. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Wojtek. Okay, I was interrupting already, but thank you very much for giving the opportunity to ask another question. So Ignacia, 
this was a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, it's always good to see, to meet someone else that have all these things a little bit differently packed in, the, in our heads because it's a very compact uh, involved subject. But the quick question for you is the following. So the alpha M is the yeah, conformal parameter that in principle is the just, uh, can be expressed as the, the change in time of the effective uh, Gaussian constant, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. But, but we have, what we really have are two anchor points at redshift zero and redshift BBM. And this is what it says is super. Can you imagine that it can be that dynamical parameter that somehow oscillates around this most or minimum energy value and then can be over the history a little bit above, a little bit below the, the current so the current uh, value. So you would get a different effect and then constraining this to the G uh, Newton uh, using BBM would just say that it's over there at redshift uh, um, million or something, it was close to GN, but in between it could have some freedom, right? So, I mean, I would say it, it, there's a bit more freedom than that because uh, if you're a little bit um, optimistic, let's say, uh, and in this business, uh, which is that um, in principle, what we know is the value of G here on Earth. Yeah. Right? And it's not true that this is the same as the value of G for cosmology. Because this is, uh, you know, that's really some, some, some value of G for perturbations which are, this, which are cosmological scales, you know, megaparsec plus. So if you if you form the body the size of a megaparsec, maybe you would find the G has a slightly different has slightly different strength. So in principle, we might not know what that is, um, and it could be different than what it is in measurements on Earth. And the story of screening is exactly sort of related to that. In that, yeah, on Earth pro probably gravity screened, so it's really very. You would expect it to be very similar to the way it was when the universe was very dense. But maybe out there in this kind of very under dense regions of the universe, in fact, you're you're really dealing with different with different physics. But I, you know, given that that the models are what they are, I don't know how to construct a model which would allow you for for a very large change yeah. in this particular way. But in principle, it's true that you don't know what G Newton is doing there. So then, um, but then if you're really in a situation where you know, you, you have an anchor at BBN and an anchor today, and you assume G Newton on Earth is what it is in cosmology, then it seems very, you know, why, why would, it seems very strange that you would end up having this, 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 uh, yeah. this, you know, a significant change in one direction and then a compensatory change the other way. I mean, it's, it's true that alpha M could be zero today, by the way, that wouldn't be such a bad thing because, I mean, that wouldn't be so unlikely because you think it's a, it's a dynamical object, right? It's a derivative of, of G Newton. So if the universe is settling towards some future asymptotic state, you'd expect it to go to zero eventually because you would expect it to reach the final, you know, and Planck to be whatever it needs to be in, in the far future. So it could be decaying, but having it oscillate around uh, to get back to the original value seems a little bit uh, uh, contrived. Yeah. Maybe a very quick final comment uh, is that it would be that uh, all you said is very nice uh, with respect to probing new theoretical possibilities and model building, mm -hmm. but you probably will agree with me that at the very first step, if you go to the whiteboard or blackboard, you first need to assume that the true lambda, uh, Einstein's lambda is equal zero by so unknown symmetry, and then you can accelerate universe effectively or not, then all these theories still would have to involve lambda. And if they would uh, promote some, uh, uh, some uh, some way to accelerate the universe, the, the, the true lambda should be smaller because the combination of both gives you omega dark energy. So, so, so all this also all this is yeah all, you, you're completely right. Um, and then the only thing I would say is that um, uh, the you know a few years ago this is exactly the con this is exactly the complaint you would have got from anybody doing you know whether theoretical physics string theory etc. And yet, it's also true if you look at you know if you look at the archive today or talk to string theorists, they, they've become obsessed with this idea of uh, of this you know, of the swamp land and the yeah. and the fact that the sitter itself cannot exist. So there's a huge number of you know there's there's a, there's a very large body of work now trying to figure out some way of not having a cosmological constant uh, because uh, the sitter is you know is unstable it seems. Um, so. Um, <sighs> You know, maybe it cannot exist by by just pure theoretical arguments, and then you really have to have something that is a that is a is a time evolving that is just something else, right? Yeah. 
So Bojana wanted to ask a question. I think we can still uh, spare some minutes. Yes, Bojana. Okay. okay. I I have a, a, a naive uh, question from observational point. Mm -hmm. If I measure the expansion of the universe, let's say using quasars, whatever, mm -hmm. is it really enough to uh, use a general parameterization of W, like W not equal minus one or W not not equal zero. Is it good enough, or I miss something on the on the possible shape of the expansion if I don't use more advanced theoretical models? Um, um, okay, so uh, so I think the issue is that the uh, if you were to deal with H zero in some way, the, let me go back to the slide where that I copied from Planck, um, this one. Uh, you know, you really seem to have to do something quite radical at really very late times. So the, you know, part of the, uh, a complaint you might have with regards to this sort of simple, uh, uh, you know, uh, constant plus first, uh, first Taylor term uh, is that it's too smooth for any physics like that and you would completely miss it, right? Um, in, the, in the case of quasars, we will cover the, the, the redshift range, well, more or less all what you have on your plot. No, no, so, 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 the, the, so the, then we need really the, the whole shape. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah the, the issue is the following, is that actually the, um, uh, you know, the thing that matters in the end is not W, the thing that matters is H. Right, so the way I formulated all these, you know, the way I formulated these these perturbation uh, equations is really with respect to some background h of z, and you can put whatever you want in there, but uh, you know, whatever you put in the w's, by the time you get to redshift one, it's sort of dominated by the dark matter part. So kind of you don't care about what w is doing here at all, right? For the large redshifts, it's really dominated by dark matter. What you do care about is really what it does really right at the end here, and and this is the bit that, in fact, I think you, you miss if you just do a simple Taylor expansion. Um, so, so if you look at the, the, the sort of ideas, for example, that the scanty gravity braiding model produces, uh, the sort of backgrounds that it produces, it's really, what it actually does is that W is minus two there for, for a while, and then it goes up uh, and it becomes minus one eventually. So it goes to minus one from below. Um, and it's really very non-trivial when it's not describable by a simple, by a simple, uh, uh, by a simple way, Taylor expansion. But from the point of view of what's happening, you know, but this really gives you an extra, well, on the other hand, if you want to be a devil's advocate, you say, look, okay, fine. So there's an extra bit that I get, that I lose, you know, at very, a very low redshift, but it's just some constant, essentially, as far as anything that's at large distances is concerned. Because I've added some extra distance, so maybe this is the way to do it. You just add a bit of an extra distance, whatever, it's some, which, which nothing beyond redshift 0.5 will ever know about, apart from the fact that everything is offset by this distance. Um, and then you just have some power law on top of that. Do you understand? Okay. So, so, so maybe you know, okay, what, so this is what I'm advocating is that distances might, so okay. that you might improve this by saying that W is whatever, some power law, plus you get some additional term, which is just some additional distance that you get between zero and whatever, you know, 0.5. And yeah, maybe that's, I, maybe that's a good parameterization. All, all, function, all functional form, right? Because my AGNs will cover all the distances, right? So I need the whole shape. Uh, no, I know, you, I, I know you do, but I'm saying, but if you want to write down some H of Z, uh, you, you might just go with just an additional clutch, which is something, uh, some unknown stuff that happens at late times very late times, which is just as far as, you know, as far as quasars are concerned, it's just some, just something that happens over here and it's a single number. You know, the details in supernova, you can't do it because in supernova, you're really very sensitive to, to exactly this, this, this bit, right? Gotcha, but Z is, the, is logarithmic scale. So between half and zero is actually more, half of the universe expansion. So it's not so, no, all these points on the right actually are very close to each other in the time and this Reese point is very far away, so it looks like it's close to both, but it's actually not. If you think about the well, no, but time. then, but but then, in terms of evolving, uh, the rate at which things evolve, 
things might evolve quickly here because the universe is evolving quickly, but things probably will evolve very slowly over here with H being your typical time scale because it's the only time scale of the problem, right? Yeah, so, sure. so I think it's really the correct way of looking at it. It's really that you in principle might get, you know, you're as likely to get a big change over here as you are somewhere here, I think. Mm. Um, and it's this bit that needs to be somehow collapsed by something. Okay, I'm afraid we have to wrap thank up. Uh, so thank you to all those who ask questions. Uh, thank you very much to our speaker. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you for thank you for listening. Thank you.